Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. I love this podcast so much, and I love all of you guys for following and being on this amazing journey at an amazing time. And thanks for all your likes and your comments. I read them. And thanks for subscribing to the show. I'm excited today, really excited, because it's been too long and it's perfect. We have a guest back today, Daryl Anka is here and will be on in just a few minutes. And we're going to be talking about how time and changes and manifesting creates outcomes, amongst other things. This show has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. We were just, we just received the COVR Best Radio and Podcast Show Award and currently listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcast to listen to this year. Grateful to all of you for listening, watching, being involved, and for helping this show get there. I think it's an important message. I also want to thank Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They sponsor this show and they do energy work out into the world. If you would like to become a facilitator or take one of their classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. And what do I do out in the world? I am a media visibility specialist. I help people to write a highly engaging book. I'm a book writing coach. I also have a company that takes an author's book to a guaranteed international best-selling status, fully done for the author. And the third leg of what I do around media visibility is teach you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. I've got a gift for you if you'd like to learn how to do pieces of this because your visibility, you, you are a light worker if you're listening to this show and you came here with a message, piece of the puzzle of heaven here on earth. It is your time really to be visible at a time when people probably need what you have to say and your expertise. Please accept my gift to you. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. I've got templates, how-to videos just for you, D-E-B-B-I. D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash gift. <laughs> so I'm speaking today with the renowned channel, Daryl Anka. I think this is his fourth time on the show. And for over 35 years, Daryl has been in front of individuals all over the world who make the journey to experience Daryl as he channels the remarkable non-physical being from the future known as Bashar. Along with Edgar Casey, Seth, and Abraham Hicks, the Bashar material has been proclaimed as some of the most relevant, compelling, and dynamic information delivered to the planet to date. In addition to channeling Bashar, Daryl expresses his creative talents in the forms of writing, directing, and producing films through his own production company, Zia Films. And a little bit later, he'll also share a whole new awesome creative project he and his wife are working on. Daryl is also the author of several books. And if you'd like to learn more, go to bashar.org. And you can also see Daryl coming up in February, Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles. And I will have links so you can get tickets to that in the show notes. And with that, I welcome Daryl back to the Dare to Dream show. It's awesome to have you here. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so much. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Mm, always, always. A um, couple of little things. Um, it's actually in 2023, I will have been channeling for 40 years. Mm. And and uh, Bashar is actually a physical being, not a non-physical being. That's interesting. They're quasi-physical. They're ev evolving out of physicality. So they have qualities of spirit and physical beings, both. But he is still perceived as physical. I know oh. that sometimes people don't really get the quasi-physical thing. So I just want to make sure that the record is set straight. Yes, and I appreciate that so much. And when you say quasi-physical, meaning that he can, by choice, become physical and at other times be pure energy? They're approaching that. It's, it's a state of being, as he's described it, that has the quality, some of the qualities of spirit, of non-physical beings, uh, but they still do have a physical presentation as we would perceive them. Amazing. Okay. And 40 years channeling. Congratulations. Thank you. 
It's amazing. Did you ever think you'd be here? No, <laughs> it never dawned on me, really. I just followed it where it led. And here we are. And here we are. And tell me about 2022. What new things did you work on? What new things did you create? Well, uh, my wife, Erica, and I are going in a new direction. <clears throat> um, we're not doing films right now. We have started developing uh, what is called an escape room <clears throat> now in the Calabasas area of San Fernando Valley. Uh, escape rooms, for those who don't know, <clears throat> is a relatively new form of entertainment, I think since about 2012 in the United States, where you acquire a space that has several rooms in it, and you outfit the rooms with a different theme, different designs, different set decorations, so to speak, to create a kind of adventure or an immersive experience. And you have to find clues and solve puzzles to get from one room to the next to the next in order to be able to get through the entire experience within a limited amount of time, usually 60 minutes. Uh, that's why they're usually called escape rooms because the original ones were all about escaping within an hour from the environment. Now they're starting to evolve more into, like I said, uh, going on missions, achieving a goal, still within a limited amount of time, either 60 minutes or 90 minutes or something along that line. Uh, but now not so much about escaping, but really being immersed in a different reality, um, really expanding your thought process to look at these puzzles and call upon different uh, skills and abilities of making connections and changing your perspective. Uh, and it's a good bonding experience for friends uh, to create a team to do this. Uh, and it's very good for problem solving, even you mm -hmm. know, out in the world, because it really teaches you to start looking at things and think in, out of, outside the box, so to speak. In very now, what happens if the hour is almost up and you haven't solved the problem? Yeah. Yes, you please. vaporize <laughs> what happens to you leave. You're, you're let out of the room you may be uh <clears throat> explained what what puzzles you missed and mm. things like that uh but yeah there's a limited amount of time because you have to book these online and, and you have a, a certain appointment schedule so uh if you don't make it you don't make it but the real point is did you have fun you know mm. what, was it a fun experience for you whether you got out or not but i think i would time, love most, this yeah most people will get out if they're experienced. And do you change the theme? Is this like you'll have one theme this week or this month and then you keep changing it? Most escape rooms rarely change the themes. Sometimes they will when they've been played out for quite a long time. But the way escape rooms usually expand is by building a completely new adventure. So this is good for the escape room industry and why there's not so much competition, but real community support because if you, if you have two or three adventures in your facility and someone has played the first one and they're not ready to play the second or you haven't finished the second one yet, you can tell them, well, there's an escape room over there. That way you keep them interested in going to any escape room. And so hopefully then if they are continuing to enjoy themselves, they will then come back to your escape room and play the new adventure when it opens. But there are companies in Los Angeles that have you know, like 23 adventures in seven locations in the city. So they just keep expanding. And that's what we hope to do is the building that we're in now. We have our first adventure opening sometime in the new year, maybe February, March. And <clears throat> within maybe six months to a year, we'll put another adventure in that same space. Uh, and then if people start like, you know, leaving that building to go to other places, will try and take over their spaces and keep expanding in the building. How did you get into it? Is it like you and Erica went to do this one day and said, this is amazing. Let's keep um, doing this. Let's explore this. We were looking for a more, let's say, reliable business than the film mm -hmm. industry because you know it's a really hit and miss to know whether you're going to make money, whether you're going to pay your investors back or anything like that. And so we were looking around for uh, just a much more reliable business. And, you know, we had these skills making films and we thought, well, we know that at Halloween, haunted houses are popular and stuff like that. But when we started investigating that, we said, well, you know, it would be nice to have something that's more year round. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then we heard about escape rooms and started investing and go, this is perfect because it allows us to use all the skills we have in filmmaking, set building, storytelling, 
you know, immersing people in a story, letting them live in it as if it's, you know, they're in the movie. Um, but it's a much more solid and reliable business. So, and is there a way to get on a list for when you roll this out next year? There are websites uh, like um, Escape Artists um, that give lists of escape rooms. Uh, and, and Morty, I believe, is another app or a site that lists where escape rooms are. Or again, if you just Google escape rooms in LA, we'll eventually be on that list and you can find any escape room in Los Angeles that way. Um, but they're becoming much more popular. So people are learning about them and learning to find them. How fun. Congratulations. But, thank you. But, you know, we'll, we'll let you know. We'll let other people know when we're open and, and then, you know, extend invitations to our website so people can see if that's something that they would like to do. I think I would love this. I've always watched films that are mysteries. And I'm the person in the audience always trying to stay a couple of heads you know, thoughts, you know, uh, processing what's going on, who was it never looking at the obvious situation or person and trying to figure things out. And mostly I do really well. There's been times that, yeah, I've not by a long shot known what was going on, but I actually kind of love that. I think I've got a little bit of the spy in me. So I can <laughs> love escape rooms. <laughs> I think I'd love an escape Especially room. Especially ones that actually are built on spy stories and stuff. Wow. Like murder mysteries. Yeah. All right. Perfect information for me to hear. I I was thinking about you this morning and I was just wondering, you know, here you are, 40 years channeling this energy called Bashar that so many of us love and look to for wisdom and also humor, right? Sometimes being called out. Yeah, yeah. And what for you, Daryl, has changed? So you're one person then you realize you've got this gift. You take a channeling class. And of course, you've had UFO experiences. Most of us know your story. Mm -hmm. But since then, in the evolution for you over 40 years, what has changed? Do you eat differently? Are you suddenly a vegan or pescatarian? Has your lifestyle changed? All this beautiful information pouring through you, plus your relationship with Bashar, how has it manifested in your life? Um. <clears throat> In terms of my food, I've gone through different phases. Uh, I don't ever seem to sort of stick to one thing. I just kind of feel what my body consciousness says it needs and go in that direction. I mean, I try to eat as organically and naturally as possible but uh, and keep it as light as possible. But uh, I don't really have any one particular direction. I think every person kind of needs to feel that out for themselves. I also know that as we do eventually raise our vibration, we'll just simply lose the urge to eat certain things that might be denser. So I'm, I'm a big proponent, as is Bashar, of just sort of uh, raising the vibration as best you can and seeing what it is you suddenly don't need anymore. Because if you're clear and open with yourself, you will, you'll feel that you don't need or aren't attracted to any particular substance you know, that way anymore. And it'll, it'll be a natural evolution as opposed to trying to sort of force yourself to go in a certain direction when it may not be the direction you need to go in right now. Um, but in terms of overall, I would say the biggest difference in my life is the <clears throat> more conscious awareness of how everything is connected, how everything is synchronicity and experiencing synchronicity to incredible degrees almost ridiculous degrees sometimes mm -hmm. where, you know, you'll <laughs> be thinking of something and then, you know, in the next five minutes, it'll happen. It'll appear, you know, in your life. Uh, I have one really good example of that. When we were making a movie, we were looking for a particular actor to do something and we had never, you know, this is a relatively well-known actor and you know, we didn't really know at that time how to approach. So we, you know, we wrote a letter to the actor's agent <clears throat> and said, you know, we would like to offer this part. And so, you know, we left it at that. And the next day we were invited to lunch by a friend of ours at a place we almost never go. And we walk in the door and the actor is walking out and it's just like, bang there. And we could got a chance to talk with the actor. 
So, you know, it's, it's things like that that have increased in my life. It's just the right place, the right time, everything falling into place more and more and more. And especially it's been what has instilled in me the willingness to know that if I just keep following my passion, things fall into place. They just automatically do. And I know that I can't convince anyone of that. You have to experience it for yourself. But when you do get to a certain level, the way synchronicity starts working to your advantage and what it brings you automatically in perfect timing can really seem quite magical. Mm, what a great story. Wow. Are you a hybrid? Really? Are well, you a... According to Bashar, all humans are hybridized to some degree. So, Understood. you know, we may have different people may have more or less genetic connection to different other beings and so on and so forth. So I think we're all hybrids. It's just a matter of what we choose to do with the awareness of any connection we may have. Yeah. I'm just curious. I have like, I have a client right now and she's, you know, as soon as you meet her, when mm. she says she's an Octurian hybrid, yeah, okay. you get that. And so her father is on a ship somewhere in Octurian and her mother was quote unquote earthling. Mm. And that's, that's the kind of hybrid I was wondering about. I, as far as I know, I was born on earth. Mm -hmm. But again, who knows about genetics? I have my own mysteries to solve. Bashar has dropped some interesting breadcrumbs for me mm. to follow with regard to my ancestry and the history of, you know, my background uh, in terms of uh, my connection to things like the Middle East or things like Ireland, which I'm connected to both. Mm. Um, so, you know, I've been following this little puzzle. And it's led to some very interesting <laughs> revelations about ancestral connections and things like that. So, yeah, I understand all that. Um, but for me, it's it's more of a puzzle to solve than anything. Nice. Yeah, there's nothing like a good galactic reading <laughs> for your ancestry to, to turn your life around. It's pretty profound. Mm -hmm. I've had one. I had um, Debbie Solaris on the show. If you know who she is, she's brilliant. She's an encyclopedia, someone who had a huge awakening, was a, had with a military background, was so not into this stuff, which makes it even more fun. And then had this huge awakening and pff, downloads. The information that pours out of her is really impressive. Cool. And she does these galactic readings. And it's beautiful to hear from the inception of your soul way beyond this planet and galaxy to understand all of who you really are. Yeah. Speaking of readings, I went a very interesting one late uh, recently. Um, Cause now and then I will just feel the urge to sort of check out a psychic mm -hmm. just because I get the urge to do so. And <clears throat> this person was pretty straightforward, pretty right on. And at the end, I think, said one of the most interesting things I've ever heard someone say to me who didn't know me at all. She didn't even know my last name, didn't know what I did or anything. And she said, I, I have something that I'm picking up that's really kind of odd. And I don't know if you'll understand what I'm going to say to you because I've never said anything like this to anyone else. But she said, it's like, I'm getting that you have two brains. One of them is connected to earth and one of them is connected to another planet. And I said, I understand you completely. <laughs> Wow. So yeah, she picked up on the idea of Bashar without knowing anything about him or that he was an ET or anything like that. And that's the way she interpreted it is that I have a connection with two brains. Yeah. That kind of stuff is amazing. <laughs> you know, verifying. And then I'm sure everything she said before it was probably fairly interesting as well. So that's cool that you do readings too. You give readings, you get readings. <laughs> it's yeah. I actually, yeah, I mean, Bashar doesn't do reading so much as he's just giving information that will help us like a toolkit. But mm -hmm. I used to do uh, tarot readings a long time ago. That's one of the things that I found I was led to do. Uh, and that sort of gave me the practice of exercising those energies within myself. Yeah. Uh, and it was after that, that I found a, a class where someone did, um, taught you how to do, um, I guess what he called junctioning or psychic junctioning or emotional connection to other people so you could feel what they were feeling empathically mm -hmm. and it was then the next leap was the channeling class from there so there was a real progression 
of things that sort of honed all of those abilities within me so that I guess by the time I went into the channeling class, I would at least be familiar with what those energies felt like by doing the tarot readings and all that. Yeah, tarot is no joke. I didn't even get it. Like this past year, I've been connected with somebody. And when she lays down the cards, I don't even understand how she knows what she does beyond the matrix. Same, yeah. doesn't know me, doesn't know the characters in my life. And yet, uh, I think it's a profound tool when somebody's good at it. Yeah, I mean, it's a permission slip, like Bashar says, like anything else. It's something that someone uses to trigger their own abilities to pick up, you know, the mm. vibrations of what they're picking up. But they use the cards as a way that it's it's a symbolic language that something within them understands how to use. So it, it just allows them to go there a little bit more easily. Uh, and, it, and they work slightly differently, I think, for everyone. For me, it was like looking at the symbols, I would actually see different symbols kind of rise up or make themselves more colorful than any other symbol. And I knew that's what I had to pay attention to at that particular moment. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting tool to use. Do you still, do you ever pull them out? No, I haven't for years and years and years since I've been doing the channeling. No need. No, not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> not if you know Bashar. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about time okay. and your understanding about us and time. What is the relationship between you or me and time? Well, as Bashar describes it, time is kind of a side effect, a side effect of our <clears throat> consciousness shifting through different parallel realities, billions of parallel realities every second. Yeah. That, so it's like he sort of uses the analogy of a um, film strip. Mm -hmm. So you have all these different frames <clears throat> and each frame is really just a still picture. There's no movement, there's no time, there's no experience in the, in the single frame. When you get the experience of time is when you run the frames through a projector. So he's basically saying our consciousness is kind of like the projector. And we're filtering different frames of parallel realities through our consciousness projector and creating the illusion uh, and the experience of change and motion and so on and so forth. And therefore, that's what we call time. And this whole idea of multidimensionality and parallel timelines, mm -hmm. I understand it. I accept it. It's also mind boggling, sure, to, right? to fathom that while this film you're talking about is going on, this right. is, and this is just my space, mm. brrr, projectors, all right. different outcomes, all different choices, all different relationships. All at once. All at once. Again, he uses a, you know, the television analogy. <clears throat> there are dozens of programs playing at the same time. They don't interfere with one another because they're on different frequencies. If you change the channel, you get a different story. But that doesn't mean that the program you were watching a minute ago isn't still running. So it's they just all overlap, but they're separated by the fact that they operate on different frequencies. Yeah. I'm watching this really cool program right now called Peripheral, mm -hmm. uh, based on an amazing book and highly recommended, great nice. sci-fi. And this is part of the storyline. Uh, something is going to go severely wrong, like something's going to be blown up and they call something a jackpot, which really means the end of the world. So they are right now contemplating to end that timeline and the person in that timeline and shift them into another. Do we have that ability? Is that something? I think we do that all the time. Every choice you make, according to Bashar, actually immediately shifts you. Again, remember, we're already shifting. We can't stop shifting. That's a natural thing that we do to experience physical reality. So it's not about learning to do that or learning to change it. We are changing realities literally all the time, according to him. We, in this conversation, we have shifted through billions of versions of Earth. It's just that we create this sense of continuity and agreement on a higher level that says, oh, no, we're on the same planet and it's just changing a little bit. He's saying, no, you're on a different Earth, literally billions of times per second. Wow. So if you understand that you're already always shifting, <laughs> once you consciously get a handle on that concept, you can more consciously direct what you're shifting to by the choices that you make. Because again, it's all about frequency. 
And if you start making choices that are more aligned with the frequency of different versions of Earth that are more creative, more productive, more positive, that's what you start experiencing. If you don't, then you start experiencing the opposite of that. So to him, it's just physics. It's whatever you are is what you experience. And it's all about resonance and frequency and vibration of energy. And is there any way to know? Is there any way to know, oh, this would have been a trajectory, but something just happened and I just shifted paths? Sometimes that makes itself apparent. There are experiences that people have had. Uh, and that, I don't mean that the, every situation like this is always this case, but I'm sure you have heard of things called the Mandela effect. Yeah. Where you have different people honestly, truly remembering different histories. Mm. I think it's because we are starting to become conscious of the fact that we actually do have many different histories as we shift. Because according to Bashar, anytime you shift, and again, billions of times a second, you're not only changing the future, you're changing the past. Because the idea is that if you become a new person in a new reality, from a linear perspective, looking at it from a physical point of view, you had to have had a different history to become the person you are now. So when he's saying you're shifting in the present, it comes with a new future and a new past immediately to explain why you are this person in the present. Because if you become a different person, you have to have had a different past to become that person. Oh my God, this is so cool. You know, this woman that I was mentioning that I've been now and then doing these tarot with, and she's exactly as you described. I I love how you said that her gifts come through the tarot and she's clearly very gifted. And I was asking her a question about, you know, just based on what you see, do you think I should do this or not? Do you think I should leave this situation or stay in the situation? Now I have been spiritually changing massively the last, mm -hmm. the last year, but especially the last four months, like I have taken this on as a mantle I'm on this path and I'm open, whatever it takes. At the same time, I enrolled um, starting two months, I'm going to be beginning a university for shamanic energy practices. Cool. I'm highly called to it. Cool. And so I'm going to be in school and, uh, you know, however many hours this takes until I get to the end of this. And she was looking at all of this and saying, I actually can't give you an answer. Because while we're speaking, you're changing your destiny. I don't know if it's right for you or not. Right. See, that's the thing that Bashar talks about. When people talk about things like predictions, he's saying there's no such thing as a prediction of the future. When someone makes a prediction, what they're sensing is the energy that exists at the moment the prediction is made. And they're basically telling you, look, if this energy doesn't change, then this is likely to manifest. But the fact that you are now being given the insight as to what the energy is at the moment can change the prediction and actually make it obsolete. So it's not that a lot of predictions that are made about the so-called future turn out wrong. It's just that somebody said, let's not go that way when they be, were made aware of what the energy was leading to. This is why Bashar is usually very reluctant to make predictions because he says, you, you, as soon as the prediction is told to you, you have the option of going, well, let's make something else happen. And the only, the few times, very few times that he has actually been willing to predict something, he's saying, well, the energy was so strong, the momentum behind it was so strong in your collective consciousness that it was probably unlikely to change. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it was, and I think this is on tape, in 1998, I believe mm. he actually said before the end of 2001, there's going to be a terrorist attack in your New York. And he was right. And then when, you know, I think it was a couple of years before uh, he said, you know, when people were asking him about, you know, elections and things like that, he said, well, in 2016, everything is going to change. And there's going to be ripples that will stretch outward from that, that you will always be able to trace back to that moment in 2016. He mm -hmm. wouldn't say anything more about it, but he said, everything's going to change. And I believe that he hit the nail on the head because ever since 2016, things have been upside down in this world. So mm -hmm. you can sense when there's a lot of energy behind something and when the probability of it changing is so 
low, it just simply will keep rolling forward because that's what we're setting up for ourselves. So he sees it as an opportunity for us to get the consequences of our choices yeah. and decide from those consequences whether we want the same thing to continue or whether we want to make some changes. And then if it's you and somebody else or other people, there's just your part. So that could change. Yeah. There's your part and there's the agreement between the collective. So it's up to you to decide what your relationship to the collective is, what's correct for you, what's not. And uh, to make some determinations about what kind of choices you would like to make. You will always, as long as you're physical, still respect certain aspects of the collective, even if they're just general aspects, like, okay, we're in physical reality and there's such a thing as gravity and so on and so forth. Bashar likens it to playing a game of chess. He says, you know, if you play a game of chess, <clears throat> you can have pieces made out of different materials. You can have all sorts of different strategies for playing that game but you're following the rules of chess. Otherwise, you're playing a different game. So you'll probably still agree to play by the rules of the earth physical reality paradigm, but we're now more capable of choosing what kind of pieces we're playing with, how we play with those pieces, um, how we relate to the collective and how we don't. So it's becoming freer in that sense as we become, become more conscious of the fact that we are the ones creating our reality experience, both collectively and individually. Can you talk a little bit about ascension and symptoms? I heard somebody really fascinating and pretty science-based talking about it. And she was mentioning people are having all sorts of symptoms. I don't know if you agree, but things, your stomach, hair falling out. Yeah. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, I had symptoms when I started channeling because it's a product of raising your vibrational frequency, but something you're not yet used to or your body is not used to handling mm. look at yeah let's look at it literally electrically <clears throat> because it's very similar if you put a very large electrical charge on a wire that's not built to handle it mm. you get resistance and when you get resistance the wire heats up the wire can even melt so the idea is that our nervous system <clears throat> is used to handling the flow of a certain frequency of energy when we start tapping into higher frequencies, we have to get used to that. We have to train our nervous system and our physical cellular structure to be able to open up and handle those frequencies. And while we're going through that process, there can be you know, little resistances and blockages based on our belief systems and, and what have you, what we're used to, what we've been trained to think like that needs to be changed in order to open up enough to allow the energy to flow more freely. So when I started, channeling the first couple of years, I would actually get real sharp pains in the back of my neck about 24 hours before I would channel. I would come down with what felt like flu-like symptoms. But as soon as I started to channel, it all went away, literally in that moment. So I started to recognize, okay, this is just a symptom of trying to get more energy, connect with a higher frequency and let that come through without resistance without belief systems that say, oh, I should be careful here. I should be afraid of this. What's going to happen? Maybe something bad will happen. Or am I good enough? Or you know, am I able to do this or whatever? All those things need to be flushed out of your system to really allow the higher energies, a free flowing sort of super conductive ability to go through your nervous system in a way that's unimpeded. This is incredible. Because that actually, I mean, maybe people don't agree with me, but to me, that sounds simple. That's <laughs> you know, right. And it's, it's what we aspire to hopefully anyway, is to rid ourselves of all these self-imposed obstacles, limitations, fears that are getting in our way anyway. Right. But that's kind of the process of being a physical being on earth is because we want to discover ourselves from a new perspective, a new point of view. We want to remember who we are after having forgotten who we mm. are. But that process allows us to see ourselves in a new way and grow spiritually by having a new experience. So <clears throat> it's, you know, what Bashar says is like, you know, the structure of existence never changes. Creation grows because our relationship to it changes. Our experience of existence changes and we experience new things, even though the structure is the same structure. So it's that discovery process finding ourselves that this goes back to the old adage know thyself you know if the more you really understand who you really are as a reflection of the infinite a reflection of all that is <clears throat> but having experienced or discovered that 
through this process of forgetting who you are so you can remember who you are from a new perspective, then that is added to your soul's experience and it adds to your soul's growth. And since we are ascending, that mm -hmm. means we are actively still doing this. Absolutely. We have not arrived. Is there anything else we can never. expect? You will never arrive. In other words, it goes on forever. Mm -hmm. Yes, you'll reach stages and you'll go beyond. But as far as I understand it, at least from Bashar's perspective, this is a process that never ends. It may happen in different ways, very different ways than we experience it in physical reality, but it never ends because there is no beginning and no ending to the idea of creation and existence. So it'll just be something we can choose to experience in all the ways we can even imagine and mm -hmm. ways we can't even imagine at this point. And regarding the power of paradox, is there a way that negative situations, assumptions, or experiences can be reversed Absolutely. by understanding the paradox hidden within them? Well, exactly. The, the moment you actually real, really discover or realize what the paradox is and what you're experiencing, uh, it usually just immediately, it's an aha moment. It's a gestalt moment of, of recognition and it just goes away. The resistance goes away and the negative side of it can vaporize very quickly uh, unless you have a pension for testing yourself over and over again, which <laughs> some people do because of their beliefs just to make sure, just to make sure, just to make sure. <clears throat> but the idea as Bashar has explained it is, if you understand the structure of existence, which is what he's been attempting to teach us for many years, what he calls the formula and things like that are literally descriptions of the structure of existence and how we use it to create our reality experience. So that if you understand the nature of existence itself, you will understand, let's say for example, <clears throat> People think, oh, you know, I have to learn to trust. No, you don't. You're always trusting something to be true. Even if it's a negative thing, you're trusting that that's true. We always trust. So that's the truth. We're always trusting. The issue is not you have to learn to trust. The issue is you need to learn to trust in what you prefer instead of what you don't. Because trust is something that's automatic for you. It's like manifestation. Well, we're always manifesting something because if we didn't, we wouldn't be having a physical reality experience. It's what are you manifesting? People say, I'm disconnected from source. You can't be disconnected from source or you wouldn't exist. So the idea again is you can use your connection to have an experience of disconnection. And the paradox is you couldn't possibly have an experience of disconnection if you weren't connected. So when you understand how things actually work, you can suddenly see the opposite side of whatever negative experience you might actually be having and realize, wait a minute, I can create an experience of feeling like out of, I'm out of control, but I'm controlling that. <laughs> That's so good. Right? <laughs> I totally I'm get it. I'm controlling that because I can't be out of control on that level. I can have an experience of being out of control on this level, but I'm using the control I have to create that experience. So when you see that paradox and you understand it, then everything just opens up and you start to realize, oh, I have a choice here. And as Bashar has said, our greatest gift and our greatest power is the freedom to choose. So freedom to choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Choose. Yeah. And so there's a vibration that we all have. That's our core self. Mm -hmm. And Theoretically, this is a higher guidance system, right? Yes, it's yeah, it's the connection to your higher mind, which is non-physical. Mm -hmm. And the higher mind communicates to the physical mind through energy. <clears throat> we interpret the higher mind's communication of energy and messages in our physical bodies through a vibration we have labeled passion, excitement, love creativity. When something contains more attractiveness, more passion, more excitement than anything else, what's that, what that is telling us is our higher mind is saying, this is you right now. This is your next step right now. That's why you feel so strongly about it, so passionate about doing this. But the thing of it is that most people don't quite get is because we've chosen to have a physical experience, 
even though the higher mind speaks to us in an energy language, we have to respond in a physical way to answer the higher mind, which means that's why Bashar says it's not just about getting excited about your passion. The importance is to act on your passion. It's the action that is the language of physical reality and tells the higher mind, yeah, I heard you. I heard you and I get it. And I'm willing to believe you and actually act on the guidance you have just given me. Because if you don't act on it, then the higher mind has no reason to send you more things to be excited about because you haven't even acted on what it's already sent you. Mm. Yeah. Action that creates the bond and the dialogue that then keeps going. So the higher mind goes, ah, that, you know, my physical self heard me and is showing me that they heard me by taking the actions in the direction I just guided them to take. Totally. To give them more opportunities for excitement, more opportunities to act on that are representative of their passion. But if they don't do it, it's like, well, it makes no sense for me to send things, more things that for them to act on if they haven't acted on what they've already been given. Yes, it's like you're opening the highway for opportunities to flow to you. It just magnetizes. Right. And I, I know that... Um, you know, I was sharing with you before the show started, much to my surprise, because I thought I was a professional actress and singer, but that was 15 and a half years ago. And I left that to do radio and then write books and coach and so forth. And at the beginning of COVID, music reared her beautiful head and said, hello, remember me? And the divine said, what happened, Debbie? And, you know, it was beautiful how... I was really supported through that because I was in a situation where a shaman was there. They typically don't speak up. And for whatever beautiful reason, he spoke up and shared a story, his musical journey and how he gave up music and came back to it. And then he urged me, do it. It never left you. And right. then my partner stepped up to the plate and said, you know, he took out his guitar. He was a professional guitarist and he started playing a month later we got booked at a gig right and then here we are years later that's the synchronicity i'm talking about when you when you are open to things like that everything falls into place everything you need is there it may not be what you think it may come in a different form and again that's where bashar says you need to relax your definitions about the way you think things should look because a lot of times it will come in an unexpected way and there's nothing wrong with that because that might have been the path of least resistance whereas if you're insisting that something has to happen a certain way oh, yeah you're actually limiting the way it could come to you in an unexpected way by you're shutting the door to that so it's about really opening up your definitions to different ways in which support and abundance and opportunity can come to you and not being too insistent that it has to happen a certain way because you think that's the only way it can happen because it's not the only way by far. Yes, absolutely. And this piece you were sharing about, you know, continuing to follow that passion and act, follow the excitement and act uh, sometimes spontaneously, you know, in our last gig, we had some people there who did light language and we organically just felt, well, what if during our sound healing portion and meditation, we invite you in to do sound uh, light language for the attendees and we'll do music over you. None of us know what's going to come out, but let's do this. They agreed. And it was just a gorgeous experience for everybody, which has now, you know, expanded us even into this, wanting to incorporate this more, mm -hmm. adding pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I think being open like this and letting these opportunities flood through also creates greater things, newer levels, newer ways of being. Absolutely. You know, see where it leads, you know, follow your passion. That's why he's saying act on your passion without insistence, without assumption, because you don't know where it actually needs to lead you. You really don't know. And that's the, that's where the humility comes in mm. and again, getting the negative ego out of the way and letting the ego just be its normal self and do its job of keeping you focused in physical reality experiences because he's saying, you know, the, the, the hubris is in really thinking, you know, what the best outcome could possibly be. Sometimes you might guess right, but a lot of times you have no idea what the best outcome actually needs to look like. You really don't, but the higher mind does. And that's why if you just follow the signals and don't have any assumption or insistence on what needs to manifest next, and you stay in a positive state, 
with whatever manifests, even if it's something you objectively don't prefer, mm-hmm. it's got to be there for a reason. And if you stay in that mindset, this is going to serve me somehow. I don't know how, but it's here for a reason. It's going to serve me. And if I stay in a positive state, I will be able to extract the benefit from it. If nothing else, on the most simplistic level possible, manifesting something you don't prefer gives you a much clearer idea of what you do prefer. Mm -hmm. And that is a positive way to use what you don't prefer. So once you actually are willing to do that and use everything to your advantage somehow by staying in that positive state, then you've used it up and something else can come in. Things can only happen in the now. When you refuse to accept what's happening now as having a reason for being there that could serve you, you make it stay there and you make it fill up the now and nothing else can come in until you have used it up. Mic so. drop. That was powerful. Use it. I really heard that. Use it. Yes. Use everything. What? Use everything. Use everything. Everything is here for a reason. Everything is interconnected. Everything is synchronicity. Everything is an orchestration. It's not always as important for every individual as it might be for someone else, but everyone is still there to help the orchestration happen, even if it's for someone else. So it's not always a one-to-one reflection, even sitting in a traffic jam. Who knows what other people are going through in that particular moment, but you're helping create that experience so that someone can make a realization or be prevented from having an accident down the road if they were speeding. Who knows? but it's an orchestration and it doesn't always have to be about what you're going through. It can be that you're willing to do that on another level for what someone else may be going through in the car next to you. Who knows? But does the universe have a say? Because I've been not often at all, but I have been in situation where it seemed like this was the outcome. It was very certain. This is where something was headed. And then every time it seemed headed, then the the uh, universe would step in literally and and uh, intercept and but something we, else something else are, would occur. We are the universe. There's no separation. Mm, interesting. This, okay. Everything is an orchestration. We are the universe. So we're stepping in. The universe and us are synonymous. Oh, we're so stepping in to do something that is giving us a message or information we need. It's not happening from outside. It's happening from within. We are the universe. So we have a preference that's actually, no matter what else it looks like or what's being said, we have a preference that's ultimately being enacted. That's what you're saying. Positively or negatively or neutrally, yes. Amazing. What is your understanding of light language? Light language... I'm going to make a difference between what you receive and what you interpret Mm -hmm. because light language to me is really just the natural telepathic connection we have with all that is, and Mm -hmm. you're receiving it in a way that you are interpreting through your understanding, your belief systems, you're translating it into what you need it to be. But to me, light language is just the vibrational frequency of existence itself. It's the frequency of the multiverse. It's it's the vibration given off by all that is. How each of us interpret it, Mm -hmm. how we step it down or translate it and express it in our physical reality is the way we need to do it. Again, another permission slip. It doesn't mean that that's exactly the way it exists on its own level. So what do you mean by that exists on its own level? Well, in other words, what we call, what we interpret, what we experience as unconditional love, how we translate that idea, Mm -hmm. unconditional love, that feeling, that's simply to me, the actual frequency of existence itself. It's that's what we're, we're calling it unconditional love because the frequency of existence is unconditionally supportive, unconditionally allowing. Mm -hmm. So it's just, that's you're experiencing the frequency of god if you want to call it that or all that is but that's its frequency that's its core vibration and therefore Mm -hmm. we can interpret that core vibration 
as light language, as unconditional love, as many create, you know, creative expression, any number of ways. But it is, to me, that's just the frequency of existence itself. And I'm amazed that there are certain people out there who can, who do light language. And then while they're in the flow of this coming through, they will suddenly stop and in English, mm -hmm. tell the people exactly what was just said and then go right back into it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm amazed at that. Everyone has different skills. Everyone has chosen to have a different way of connecting to those things that adds to the tapestry mm. of all the different ways that we have of communicating those things to people. Mm. So it's just about, does that, you know, does that interpretation, does that translation work for you? Yes or no. If it does, great. If it doesn't, you'll find what you need in some other way. You'll connect some in some form. other way and bring it through in some other way because we're all unique. As Bishar has said, we're all puzzle pieces. When mm -hmm. you have a puzzle and you put all the pieces together, they form the big picture. Mm -hmm. Well, no two puzzle pieces are alike. So you have to be your unique shape and you have to validate your individual diverse self in order to actually fit with all the other individual pieces that then make up the whole. So the whole can support the pieces and the pieces support the whole. If you're trying to be a shape that you're not, you're not gonna fit in the puzzle. It doesn't make sense to you. It's not an aligned vibration. <laughs> so being what you are, discovering who you are, what the piece is, what shape you are, and what unique gifts, talents, and expressions you have, if validated equally among everyone, will create harmony. As Bashar says, harmony is not the product of homogenization where everyone is the same. It's the validation of all the diversity within us that actually makes us mesh. Mm, I love that explanation. Beautiful. <laughs> to experience manifestation, it's really about a frequency which you that, always are. Remember, you always are experiencing something to manifest or you would have no experience. So yes, it's about frequency in terms of what you manifest. What is the origination of that frequency, how it progresses and what we ought to know how to successfully employ frequency? This kind of connects into the idea of the law of attraction. <clears throat> and I think there's a little bit of either a misunderstanding or kind of a piece missing uh, from what most people understand the law of attraction to be. It's not wrong that you have to be a certain frequency to manifest a certain thing that is of that frequency. That is correct. I think where people have a little bit of a misinterpretation <clears throat> is they think they have to learn the frequency of manifesting what they truly need in life. They don't. This is one of those paradoxical things. Your core frequency, your core vibration, whatever it is that really makes you uniquely you, will always automatically attract every single thing that is important in your life that you need to have a fulfilled life of joy and creativity and love. It's not that we have to learn to create that frequency. That frequency is natural to us, and we're always giving it off just like a beacon or a lighthouse. What we have to learn is to not get in the frequencies way with mm -hmm. negative beliefs, fear-based beliefs that block what the frequency you're naturally attracting things with is trying to attract to you. So it's more about getting out of our own way than it is having to learn to attract what we need. That's automatic. It's what built into us. It's who we are. So it's about clearing out your belief systems, not interfering with that frequency, and allowing it to bring you what you truly need in life. And notice that I didn't say what you want. I said what you need. Because many times your wants and your needs may coincide, but very often they do not because the wants may be the product of the negative ego or something else that's a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of what you think you need to get along in life. And what you really need will always make you feel fulfilled and will bring you joy because there are very basic needs in life. And if they are fulfilled, you're doing fine. And it's that simple. You just have to examine your beliefs and let go of the ones that just don't work, that don't resonate for you, that are not your truth, that you probably picked up from your parents, your friends, your school, your society, that have nothing to do with you. 
you know, part of what you mentioned before the show is Bashar's humor. He's talked about the idea that, you know, as we go through life and physical reality, we keep picking up other people's beliefs. So he's saying, don't be a belief thief. <laughs> don't steal other people's beliefs. Your beliefs weigh nothing. If you feel weighed down, it's because you're dragging around people's beliefs that don't belong to you because they're heavy, because they don't match your frequency. Let them go. Lighten up. Drop what is not yours. Carry what is yours, because what is yours weighs nothing. Beautiful. You know, another quote from Bashar is that dysfunctional systems will fall under their own weight. Mm -hmm. Let them. Yeah. Is that what's going on right now in the planet? Because there's I think so. so much chaos. Well, yeah, because we're getting everything out on the table so we can see what we do and don't prefer. He calls it the splitting prism. <clears throat> Literally, from his perspective, we're in a time where we're actually veering off into different parallel realities now, different timelines entirely. We can still see the other timelines because we still have time to decide, do we like that one? Do we like this one? Do we prefer this? Do we prefer that? But he's saying now you're looking at them as if you're looking at them through glass walls. You can see them. They don't necessarily have to affect you because they're on the other side of the glass wall. But they can see you and decide whether they like what you're doing and then switch their vibration to your side. Or you can see them and like what they're doing and switch your vibration to their side. But he's saying these glass walls are going thicker and thicker and more and more opaque over time. Eventually, in the years to come, he's saying you will ultimately only experience people who are at least operating on a similar wavelength to you because you've already shifted to a version of Earth where only those people exist, even if they're versions of people you thought you knew. So the idea is that you will stop seeing people that are vibrationally incompatible with you, mm -hmm. whether that means they actually die mm -hmm. physically and leave the planet, mm -hmm. or whether it means that you simply never meet them or see them again because you're on diverse paths. He says it doesn't matter. Eventually, you will only see those that are like the choices you made vibrationally. And that can be positive or negative. So again, all versions of Earth exist. Which ones are you navigating toward? The ones that are navigating toward negative ones will experience negative realities. The ones that are operating toward or navigating toward positive ones will experience positive realities. Right now, it's still a mix because we still have the freedom to choose which we really prefer. Have you ever been on Bashar's spaceship? In a dream, I have. Mm, what was it like? <laughs> very clean. Very clean. <laughs> well, it's very, it's very nondescript in a sense. I mean, there's almost nothing to see it's kind of like this sort of silvery white metallic crystalline sort of material the walls blend into the floor the mm -hmm. walls blend into the ceiling very you know very simply and in fact one thing i noticed in the dream and i've had about three or four dreams that i know are encounters in a different reality with him they're not typical dreams because that's all there is and i'm actually having a conversation with him um <clears throat> i looked over he was standing in in one part of the ship and i looked over and there was somebody else sitting at what was ostensibly the control console but it was really just like a clean ledge there was nothing there or nothing on it and telepathically bashar explained the ships are connected to the pilot's mind telepathically mm -hmm. the pilot can see the controls but no one else can mm -hmm. because they're literally bonded so it's kind of like okay well that's pretty cool <laughs> you know, uh, it's almost like that is your unique ship that is actually kind of bonded to you vibrationally. And you're the only one that needs to see the controls. And a lot of the controls are handled telepathically anyway. So yeah, I, I had that experience. I've had an experience where I was literally just sitting across from him, speaking to him, uh, having a conversation with him for quite a while. And Every time he would talk, I would be sitting there. Listen, now I could, he sort of looked more human than he normally does, but I could tell there was something odd about him in the dream. But every time I, he would talk, I would be able to get up out of the chair I was sitting in in the dream and go up to him really close and get really close to him and touch his skin. And I could tell when I got that close that his skin was not human skin. Mm -hmm. It was very, very pale, sort of whitish, a little bit of gray in it but it didn't feel like human skin but every time i would back go back to my seat he would look like a very pale human 
So I think that was just for my comfort zone. And the third one I remembered, which was very strong, was because I had always asked, well, you know, that typical question, why don't you just land? And in the dream, I saw his ship land, I saw him get out, and I saw him walk toward me. And we showed this in the first contact documentary. We, we did a CG rendering of this uh, just to illustrate the point. <clears throat> and as soon as he got within about 20 feet of me, I lost my identity completely. I saw my body through his eyes and my body jerked back to reclaim my identity. And he said, that's why we don't land. Not that you can't interact with some extraterrestrial species, but some of them are such high vibrational beings that it would kind of overwhelm your energy until you create your vibration to be more equal to ours. Mm -hmm. You would actually kind of lose yourself in our frequency. And especially because he and I are connected on a soul level. So he was saying, you know, a lot of people are afraid of extraterrestrial encounters, not because they fear the extraterrestrials. It's because our vibration is so overwhelming it starts that in our presence, it starts to force all the things you're afraid to look at within yourself to the surface. And if you're not ready to integrate those fears, mm. you'll go into psychic shock. Wow. And so we maintain arm's distance mm. until you change yourself enough to at least meet us halfway so it won't be like a fast gear and a slow gear being jammed together, which would strip the gears. We have to be operating on a similar frequency in order to mesh. So that really illustrated the point to me as to why some of them keep their distance and why they share information. Because the information, if we use it in our lives, is actually what allows us to raise our frequency and become mm. more like them and make mm. physical contact more probable. Oh, that's beautiful. That makes me really happy that I, I do a lot of this work, that oh, I absolutely. follow folks like you and learn from you because it's constantly raising my vibration, all the wisdom that comes down the pike. It's just like, you know, food. Yeah. And constantly it is. And constantly doing that is the process of ascension. It's mm. not, like I said, there may be plateaus within that, but it's not just, oh, I'm not ascending and now I am. Mm. It's a constant process of raising your frequency. And as Bashar has explained it, which I thought was, was you know, kind of really encouraging, he says most people think of the ups and downs in life as as this okay you're kind of going up and same down to the same level up to the same level up down to the same level he's saying no think of it like this ah uh. right as long as you are in some way shape or form following your passion progressing being your true self seeking truth it's not that you go down to the same level you may go up and down but you're constantly rising Constantly, constantly rising. rising and he was saying you know he's saying you you don't recognize it because you're so used to the vibrational level you're on now mm -hmm. but he said if there was a person from like 300 years ago that could look at you you would look like you're glowing with light to them because you're on such a higher vibrational level but you're used to it so you don't see it mm -hmm. but they would recognize it because there's such a difference between a person now and a person from 300, 500, 1,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. That's cool. So we are some of those advanced civilizations that we look at now, we're that too. Exactly. Because, you know, many people think of this as like, a, you know, we're so dumb, we're kindergartners on earth and all that. And he's saying, no, you're a master graduating class. He said, earth mm. is a tough school. It's a tough school. It's a challenging school. But that's because you knew you were strong enough to go mm. through it and strong enough to change darkness into light and negative into positive and limitation into freedom. So this is a master graduating class. So congratulations. <laughs> yes, yeah. So what's new in the UFO or ET world? Is there anything new or coming that we he, should be aware of? Yeah, he's just, you know, we do these Zoom events every month <laughs> through bashar.org um, where he's giving, you know, uh, information. And answering questions and what's happening now according to him is 2023 is the beginning of the window of open contact between 2023 2033 2040 now that doesn't mean that january 1st spaceships are landing everywhere in the open but what he's saying is it's the beginning of a process where they are allowed to land where they're willing to land but now they're taking their cue from us as to when we're ready 
Mm. So he says, it'll start slowly <clears throat> and you'll start to see perhaps more sightings start mm. to happening after 2023. You might start to see closer sightings, you know, maybe something like the Phoenix Lights incident where they come mm. really close and over 10,000 people can see the ship and then it starts to become more and more common. And then there might be like isolated landings, isolated contact over the years, and then eventually groups. And then suddenly the public starts knowing, okay, this is happening until we really have full open contact in maybe the next decade or two at the most. So he's saying, this is really now the beginning of the process where it's in your hands and what you do with this will determine when we can start really interacting more closely. So we're still testing and still observing to see how you react to things like seeing, you know, I mean, because look at the, the Phoenix Lights incident, you know, I mean, over 10,000 people saw this ship pass very closely, a mile long ship pass very closely above the whole state overnight. What did we make of that? Very few people gave it any credence. It hardly appeared on the news as anything other than either a hoax or a misinterpretation. So they're watching that and they're mm -hmm. seeing they're not ready. So 2023 is the beginning of the opportunities that will be presented to us to take actions, whatever those actions need to be. And he's going to start giving us different suggestions for exercises and permission slips and activities that can help increase the probability of contact now in 2023. That's going to be along with things like the formula, the basic instruction manual he's been giving us and a deeper understanding of that. Contact is going to be the main theme he's talking about from 2023 on, because that's the beginning of the window of open contact. Oh, how exciting. Cause I love contact work. And so as soon as it warms up here a little bit more, we're gonna start going back out to places like Joshua Tree where we definitely saw spacecraft already. Absolutely. We had an amazing experience. Yeah, he's so, called out Joshua Tree as a hotspot. So mm. keep your eyes open on <laughs> in Joshua Tree. Yes, yeah, I'm excited that there'll be more opportunity there. I want to talk a little bit about your books because I love them. Uh, Shards, Shards of Shattered Mirror books. Yeah. And somebody so kindly, one, I think after you wrote your, your first in the series, somebody so sweet under a YouTube video with you and I said, Debbie, you look like Willa. And I was like, really? <laughs> I totally don't, but thank you so much. That's a huge compliment. So I've read books one and two, totally love them. Working and slowly working where on, are you at i'm halfway through the book book three three there, there okay five in total but the escape room that we're doing now is taking up all my time so once the escape room is up and running i'll have a chance to get back into writing a little bit and hopefully the third book will be out in 2023 at some point but i'm, right. I'm very appreciative that people are loving the story and and have fallen in love with willa as I have. So um, thank you very much for reading them and enjoying Yeah. Them. And so folks who are interested, Willa Hillacrissing, she's a channeled human alien hybrid and a parallel reality specialist who lives on earth 700 years in our future. And she's beautiful. Yeah. She's so adorable. And she has all these amazing friends and parallel uh, universes and their same selves appear yeah. which is fascinating talk about different choices yeah uh, willa has come through in the channeling from time to time so i just want to make sure mm -hmm. the shards of a shattered mirror series is a science fiction series there are a few things in there that i'm basing on what willa has described as her actual reality but that's only about five to ten percent so i just want people to understand that not everything in the books is actually happening in willa's life <laughs> So, uh, but I'm taking it from different channeled ideas and things like that and adding them all together to create an exciting story. But yes, she is a parallel reality specialist. She does have certain abilities uh, that are really quite cool. A lot of the characters in the book are actually in her life, uh, but I'll leave it up to people to figure out which ones are real and which ones are fictional. Oh, nice. Um, but um, yeah, but I will be getting back into that uh, very soon, hopefully. And there's other other books to come. <clears throat> nice. And they can find that on my site, darylanka.com, D-A-R-R-Y-L-A-N-K-A.com. They can get the books through that. Excellent. And they should. They're great books. I'm going to ask you something so personal. I hope you don't mind, but I'm really curious. 
you have been married to Erica for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what's your relationship style? What is your understanding that creates the longevity that you have both have experienced as well as a successful marriage? I think the two most important things is that we are friendly mm -hmm. to each other. We are friends. But I think the most important thing is that we really communicate. Anything that comes up, we talk it through. We talk about it. We bring it up. We express it. We also know that anything that might come up is not personal in the sense that it's about the other person. It's our own issues. And we're sounding boards for each other to really explore and examine what it is each person is going through mm -hmm. in the relationship and supporting that person to find the information and to make the realizations they need to grow and become more of who they are. That, in a way, is what Bashar has said all relationships are actually about. So we're kind to each other. We communicate as clearly as possible to each other. We don't take things personally when thing, issues come up within ourselves uh, for the other person. We know that there is something else going on and we're willing to explore it because we know that if we do, it will help us grow and we've always had a growth experience. I mean, bottom line is we love each other enough to do that. <clears throat> And is it one of those situations where, because every, no matter what relationship you're in, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's a lover, whether it's a committed situation, you're always going to come to a crossroads. Things will come up. And sure. do you and do you and Erica have this situation where it's about choice, which you've talked about earlier is the powerful yeah. experience that you keep choosing and rechoosing each other? Because that's our basic intention is we always want what's best for each other. And we know that's best for ourselves. Um, and we want to make positive choices. We, we never really argue. We might have differences of opinion sometimes. We might feel a little bit of triggered from something sometime, but we know that's our own issue. And we start to wonder, well, why did that happen? And we start helping each other explore that. So it's really being loving enough to be able to really support anything that's happening in the relationship as a way to further growth. And it works. It works perfectly. It works. Yeah. It works if, if you work it. <laughs> and if you know you have each other's best interests at heart. You know you love each other enough to do that. Mm -hmm. And that that's always the issue and that's always the case. So mm, thank you. Yeah. That's what makes it work for us. I know you're speaking. Uh, or Bashar is speaking, you're going to be in person this year at Conscious Life Expo, right? Yeah. Yes, for the first time since all that started. COVID. Excellent. And just as feedback, because I was there last year, I go live uh, when it when it was happening. But um, last year I was there, and even though you are were on the screen, I have to say it was, one, for me, one of the most powerful. We got the CD, the DVD, because oh. I'm like, I have to see this over and over. That was unbelievable. What I just heard, the information so transformative. So you are going to be there. It's February 10th through the 13th. Um, people can register live or live stream. I do have the link for people. You could see it anywhere in the world or 10 live, highly recommended. I'll have the link there and you're going to be channeling. Is that correct? Uh, yes, actually, I'm going to be channeling on Sunday, the 12th of February from 6 to 730 in the La Jolla room, according to what I've got. Okay, beautiful. At the, I think it's the Hilton, right? In LAX Hilton? Always. <laughs> Always. Always, yes. yes. And so we're doing a few, now we're doing not a lot, but a few uh, live things. I believe we'll be in uh, Boulder, Colorado uh, in March <clears throat> doing a live uh, channeling for people at Gaia. Um, and I believe uh, if things work out, we will actually physically be in Sedona again uh, in September of 2023. But that hasn't all been worked out yet. But we are doing a few other live things now that we're going back out into the world. Hmm. Anything here at the end that you'd like to say to the listeners and the watchers? Well, I just, you know, deeply appreciate <laughs> people following their own paths. I know there are challenges in life. But I really do encourage everyone to really act on their passion and, and do it, you know, genuinely, really examine yourself, 
make sure that what you're doing really is your passion. You're not just disguising something to look like your passion because you're afraid of doing what you actually would rather do. Um, because I know we can play those tricks on ourselves. But um, I would really encourage you to do so because it really does pay off and it really changes what you experience your life to be. And I think everyone deserves to experience themselves as connected that way. Uh, that's our birthright. And like I said, we have the power to choose. So choose wisely. Mm, I'm glad I chose you. Thank you for being with me today. I've really enjoyed this. Pleasure, Debbie. Thank you so much for having me on and allowing this kind of information to be shared with so many other people. I look forward to seeing people at the Conscious Life Expo, and I look forward to talking to you again at some point. Yes, absolutely. You will be back. Mm -hmm. And folks, again, if you, you heard his URL earlier for the Willa or uh, Shards of a Shattered Mirror books, you want to go to the Daryl Anka website. For other material, you want to go to Bashar, B-A-S-H-A-R.org. And I end today's show with this quote from Bashar. The greatest gift creation has given to all of you is that life is fundamentally meaningless. That means it has no built-in meaning. What that also means is you were designed to give it the meaning you prefer to give it. And the meaning you give it will utterly determine how you experience it. Thanks. Please subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the Dare to Dream podcast. Leave a comment and share. Next week's show is featuring the amazing Matt LaCroix, who's a passionate writer and researcher seeking the truth about ancient history and the nature of reality. Matt is also the content researcher for Gaia TV. Folks, don't just dare to dream. You heard what Daryl said. Have your excitement and your passion. Take action. Create, create, create. Because in every moment, it is all about choice. Thanks for joining us today on Dare to Dream.